Hello, uh, this is Mike Powell at Brunswick Civil War Roundtable. Uh, this is a video, a short video on some local history uh, that I'm working with Ryan Gordon at the Oak Island Parks and Recreation to put out for folks uh, while we're stuck in the houses. Uh, today we're going to talk about Fort Holmes in the uh, Civil War over on Bald Head Island. And let me bring up a little PowerPoint here. There we go. Okay. Bald Head Island is located on the east side of the, Cape, of the mouth of the Cape Fear River at Old Inlet. In 1713, it was called Cape Island, and Thomas Smith, son of the former Carolina governor, Thomas Smith Sr., was issued a land grant to establish a colony there. Its involvement in the American Revolution was limited. In 1776, it was a staging area for British operations against Charleston, South Carolina, and a garrison of about 30 men under Captain Lindsay that we see here, was left behind to occupy the newly built fort named Fort George. It was an earth fort, much smaller than what Fort Holmes would be during the Civil War, and it was located near the, uh, in the southwest corner of the island uh, near the lighthouse. It controlled the entrance to the river, and on 1776, Continental General Robert Howe launched a raid from Fort Johnston on, at Smithville of 150 men led by Colonel Polk. They accomplished little. They captured a few uh, British seamen but were scattered by guns from the Royal Navy just offshore. And a month later, the British withdrew and the war ended for Smith Island. The little that remains of Fort George is still near Bald Head Island, uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse. There's really not much left though, but there is a marker there to show you the way. Because of the treacherous waters of Frying Pan Shoals, the commissioner of the Cape Fear authorized the building of a lighthouse in 1789. The new US Congress appropriated funds and took over the project. That structure no longer exists and it was not until 1817 that the lighthouse that we know as Old Baldy was built. They learned from the first lighthouse and built it further from the shore to prevent the sand eroding from under it as it was in the first one. When the Civil War came, the Confederacy turned off the lights in the lighthouses on the southern coast to hinder navigation for the U.S. Navy. There was no maintenance of the lighthouse during the war, and the new inlet had taken over the vast majority of old inlet traffic. It was in terrible shape. In 17, in, I'm sorry, in 1879, Nature closed New Inlet, that's the one up by Fort Fisher at Federal Point. An old in, inlet regained its importance and the lighthouse had to be brought back online once again. Despite the improvements and repairs, it was still not bright enough or tall enough to properly serve the treacherous waters of frying pan shoals. So in the mid 1800s, a light ship was brought in and deployed on the shoals themselves. Old Baldy though remains the oldest lighthouse in North Carolina. In the Civil War, the importance of the blockade was immediately known to the, to the Confederates. And of course that meant Wilmington took on more importance. In 1863, Major General W.H.C. Whiting began construction on a fort to control the entrance of Cape Fear River. Fort Caswell on the Oak Island side had been there since the 1830s, since 1836 when it was completed. But the fort on, on Bald Head Island would be a new one. It was part of the Cape Fear River defense system, an extensive series of forts and batteries that went upriver to Wilmington and stretched from Smith Island and Oak Island all the way up to Wilmington. The fate of the forts is tied together. These forts fulfilled two purposes. They prevented the Navy from entering the river 
and they increased a sort of zone of safety for blockade runners. Once inside the range of the guns from these forts, Union blockaders followed at their own peril. There we see a picture of Whiting. He commanded the Department of North Carolina and South Southern Virginia. Fort Caswell was a brick, sand, and earth fort built between 1826 and 36. Before any work had begun on Bald Head Island, the Federals had planned several operations to try and capture Fort Caswell. In May of 62, Gideon Wells proposed to Admiral Goldsboro of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron that preparations for an attack on Fort Caswell be made. He suggested that the two ironclads, that there will be two ironclads available in a couple of days from the operations of George McClellan on the peninsula in his, in his quest to capture Richmond. When Richmond is captured, these ironclads would proceed to the Cape Fear River to support the operations against Fort Caswell. On June 2nd, Wells was still confident of success in Richmond. And he said, the operations against Richmond may close favorably at any moment. And in that case, it is believed that a sudden demonstration against Fort Caswell will be successful. The operations against Richmond failed in the seven days battles that, that Robert E. Lee defeated McClellan and forced him back to Malvern Hill and eventually off the peninsula. And the ironclads that took part were never released, so the attack on Caswell was not made. Other discussions about which entrance into the Cape Fear or at Old Inlet or at New Inlet was the best option for a Union attack. Planning the attack continued into January of 1863 as the belief by the Confederates that an attack was imminent. It was Admiral S.P. Lee that finally rejected the plans to attack at either place at that time. Fort Fisher was built to control the waters at New Inlet. In May of 1863, correspondents began to notice that Confederates were throwing up earthworks and batteries on Smith Island near the lighthouse. Captain Boggs wrote that Smith Island is the key to the position, and if allowed to perfect their defenses, no human means can dislodge them. General Whiting wrote, the occupation of Bald Head on our part is a matter of necessity daily growing greater. And he called for 20,000 men for the operation to reinforce the area. In April 63, Major General J.G. Foster acknowledged receipt of a letter about the possibility of occupying Smith Island, Baldhead Island. The idea is a good one and should, in my opinion, be carried out as soon as other operations will permit or render it advisable. If the 8,000 men belonging to this department now lying at Port Royal were sent back to me with the, with the abundant supply of siege, guns, ammunition, and artillery that I took with me to the Department of the South, I will at once engage to occupy Smith's Island with batteries to command the channel and to annoy Fort Caswell also as far as practical to command the new inlet channel. But less than a month later, Captain Boggs wrote, from information received from contrabands, and judging by the intercourse between that we, that we see between Fort Caswell and Smith's Island, the rebels are filling up batteries near the lighthouse on that island. Smith's Island is the key to the position. And if allowed to perfect their defenses, no human means can dislodge them. An examination of the chart will show that troops can be landed on the east side of Smith Island under cover of gunboats less than a half a mile distant. Once on shore, the island can be cleared, mortar batteries erected near the lighthouse less than two miles from Fort Caswell. A short bombardment would crush in the casemates, demolish the fort, and cause a surrender. 
The way would then be open for the ironclads to enter the river, gain the rear of the forts on Federal Point, north of the shoals, cut off all communications, and force a surrender of that post. This would give us the entire coast of North Carolina. And that is very ambitious. The Sands and Earth Fort that was being built on Smith Island was one of the largest in North Carolina and had four batteries. 12 seacoast guns were protected by pine palmetto trees and about 1,100 troops of the 40th Regiment of North Carolina troops, the old third artillery combined of heavy artillery units to create the 40th North Carolina, uh, 40th Regiment of North Carolina troops on December 1st, 1863. And they were raised on Bald Head Island from uh, units that were stationed at the various forts at Fort Caswell, Fort Pender, Fort Fisher, uh, and brought to Bald Head Island for the garrison. They were under the command of John J. Hendrick in 1863. In December of 1863, it was Hendrick who commanded that small group of militia that took possession of Fort Caswell and Fort Johnson in January of 1861, prior to hostilities. Governor Ellis forced them to give the fort back and it was not until after the firing on Sumter and North Carolina's secession that he again ordered the fort to be taken and they would hold it for the rest of the war. There was another small fort named Fort Hedrick built on Bald Head Island after Fort Holmes and was named for him and was named Fort Hedrick. Fort Holmes was named for Theophilus Holmes. Its location and description are vague, but it was near the lighthouse. Here we see a map of the of the, what we believe Fort Holmes uh, looked like. Um, uh, the portions from one, if you drew a line from one to two, everything to the below that, to the left of that. Uh, is probably now underwater. So there's very little of, uh, of, of the, uh, the uh, Western batteries uh, remaining. Civil engineer Lewis Blackford drew a series of maps and wrote about Fort Home. General Whiting's great skill as an engineer is shown at every step. I have seen no works anywhere in the Confederacy that would, that would at all compare with them. In uh, September of 1863, Whiting made a plea for more men. And now he had his fort, or getting ready to build his fort, he needed the men, and thus was created the 40th North Carolina Regiment of uh, Troops. This matter on Bald Head, he wrote, is of great importance. I beg you to consider it no longer and allow this district to remain in its present exposed, dangerous, defenseless position. He was building the fort. Now he needed the men to man the fort. In November of 1863, another attempt was, was, was planned for the capture of Fort Caswell and eventually that of, of Bald Head by Captain Reese. He reported after a brief reconnaissance of the island that, quote, the works at Smith Island is well commenced and progressing rapidly. No guns were observed. It consisted essentially of a battery looking toward Caswell and another looking towards the sea. And this last is extending toward Bald Bluff. Work is probably not yet enclosed. Six large traverses, otherwise unfinished. It's, it is an, an, an entirely commanded by Bald Bluff, which is about 30 feet high and yet unoccupied. The southern end of Smith Island is about four miles long and one mile wide, heavy with oak and undergrowth, much, much like Folly Island. Reese continued, the impression of this island would greatly be, I'm sorry, the possession of this island would greatly facilitate any operations on Oak Island against Fort Caswell. 
but it is believed the moral effect of the possession of Smith Island and a few guns opposite Caswell would effectually prevent blockade runners from using this entrance. Of course, such a landing on Smith Island must immediately be followed up the beach and occupation of Zeke's Island. Whatever is done near Cape Fear toward the closing of the blockade must be done soon. For the advantages now offered of a quiet anchorage at an occupation of the Cape itself must soon pass away and all operations by any moderate forces will be virtually impractical. He saw the opportunity, but it was missed. However, in January of 1864, 1864 is the year of decision in the West, and for the Cape Fear, it is the year of build up to the close of the year when the end comes. But in January of 64, almost a year, over a year before the capture of Fort Fisher, General Chief of the Union Halleck wrote to Secretary of War Stanton that it is the opinion of the officers who have studied the problem that the effort should be made at Fort Fisher, not Fort Caswell as others had planned in 62, not at Fort Holmes on Bald Island, Bald Head Island as others had planned in 62 and 63, but in 64, they've come around to the answer. It is to be Fort Fisher. The reduction, and this is the, his reasoning, the reduction of Fort Caswell alone will not secure to us the harbor of Smithville or close to the rebels and blockade runners access to Wilmington. To accomplish these objects, we must also capture the works on Smith Island and those which command New Inland, Fort Fisher a task not less difficult or requiring less time, even at a favorable season, than the reduction of Fort Sumter and the works on Mars Island, which he compares them to. To attempt this in the present condition of our armies will involve the suspension of other and more important operations. Halleck then recommends suspension of any such operation at this time in January of 64. He also points out that the forces for the plans in 63 have been diverted to Morris Island for operations against Charleston. He said that now the Cape Fear River defenses were much stronger, you know, larger force, and is simply not available. As in 62, until McClellan's operations uh, succeeded or failed, the fate of Caswell and, and Fort Holmes depended on that. In 63, there were other factors, other campaigns that did, that put uh, the Cape Fear River defense system on the back burner for the present. And now in 64, in April, Charles Graham described Fort Holmes based on information from pilots and contrabands. On Baldhead Island, strength unknown, Four embrasures can be seen facing the sea. Materially strengthened of late, the embankments and traverses are of unusual height and thickness. A few days later, Whiting reported on the condition of the forces in the Cape Fear region. On Fort Holmes, he wrote, on Smith Island, a very important position, are Fort Holmes, a line of works from Fort Holmes to Lighthouse Creek and various batteries in course of construction. The activity in these areas increased over the summer of 1864. Colonel Hedrick wrote to General Abair, the commander at Smithville, which is now Southport, that they fired on blockaders with a Whitworth, but the range was too far and all they accomplished was making the Union Navy aware that now they had a Whitworth uh, and this was a, a lost advantage. The Whitworth could be a gun of surprise as they had, had used it before, but they had given it away. In June, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel George Tate reported that there were more ships off the coast, seven to the east, nine to the west, off of Cape Fear, uh, off of the mouth of the Cape Fear River. And in August of 1864, General A. Bear at Smithville reported that there are troops on the enemy vessels off Masonboro. Be on alert, no, no one be absent. 
The buildup of vessels continued into the fall and the Confederates were concentrating what forces they had available at the local forts, expecting an attack on Fort Fisher. It was soon to come. But in September, Admiral Lee wrote on the condition of the Cape Fear forts. There is a heavy earthwork on the extreme point of Baldhead, that's Fort Holmes. No other batteries are visible on Smith Island. Field pieces had been used on the north side of the island to annoy the blockaders. There are no earthworks on Zeke Island, and that pretty much summed it up for them. General Whiting, again, calling for more men and more supplies and more guns and giving them his dire predictions if the Union forces do attack. Here we see the distance between the two forts and, and Old Inlet. This is what they were fighting for. The road into the Cape Fear River. There we see Charles Graham, who in April 64, impressed with the strength of the forts. And here we have Quincy Gilmore. At the end of September, <clears throat> General Gilmore proposed a plan with 6,000 men capturing Zeke's Island and simultaneously landing a force on Smith Island, Baldhead Island. Federal gunboats would force the guns of Federal Point, that's at New Inlet, at Fort Fisher, as they engaged the rest of the fleet. They wanted to force the inlet before the Confederate ironclads could make their way from Wilmington to New Inlet. So the plans to capture of Cape Fear and Wilmington had several options. Attack Caswell, attack Holmes, or as they ended up doing, the attack on New Inlet and Fort Fisher. General Whiting, with another plea for troops in September, explained his problem. The whole system of defense adopted here is predicated entirely on the presence of a movable force of Army Corps. The enemy have too many lines of attack to make self-sustaining forts of much avail. Couldn't enforce everywhere, couldn't be strong everywhere. So he called for a movable force to rapidly deploy wherever the Federals attacked. The area of course had, had, had its shipwrecks. It was frying pan shoals, treacherous waters. The whole coast was treacherous waters. One of the, uh, and one of, we won't talk about too many of them, but one we will talk about is directly uh, near where Fort Holmes, you can see the star just below, uh, just below Fort Holmes. Uh, and this is the Ella. In December 3rd to the 5th of 1864, uh, several weeks before Ben Butler's first attempt on Fort Fisher, the Ella was forced ashore by the Pequot. On the 3rd, she was driven ashore, she went aground about a mile and a half offshore, right opposite the mound battery. She had been hit by 40 plus shells from several different ships. On December 5th, a small boat party was sent in to burn her. The wreck was excavated in the 1860s and several 105 pound Whitworth shells were found with the artifacts. But 1864 had been the year of decision. There we see the Ella and the, the marker uh, that is a present day marker on the island to show where she went in, went in. In December of 1864, the attack on Fort Fisher comes, comes uh, to fruition. The ever shrinking Confederacy was closing in on the Cape Fear region and its forts. Fisher was the target the key to capturing Wilmington. By taking Fort Fisher, the forts at Old Inlet, Fort Caswell, Fort Johnston, then called Pender, and Fort Holmes would become irrelevant. The U.S. Navy need not pass them to get into the river. The capture of New Inlet with Fort Fisher gave them access upriver to Wilmington. They weren't trying to capture Smithville, they were trying to capture Wilmington. Wilmington had the railroad. And that's where the supplies were going from the blockade runners, from that railroad to Lee's army. General Ben Butler had been chosen to lead the attack on Christmas Day. Butler was a politician and Lincoln had appointed him general early in the war. 
And up to now, his performances on the battlefield had been very disappointing. His men were landed on the beach, unopposed by Confederates above Fort Fisher. The Navy had bombarded them for days before the attack. However, when Butler got near enough to see the damage that was done or not done to the fort, he chose to believe that the damage was not very great at all and withdrew his forces, thinking that his attack could not succeed. With the 1864 election over in November of 64, Lincoln no longer needed the influential politician Ben Butler, and he was replaced with a professional soldier, Alfred Terry, who would get ready for the second attack on Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher, as you can see in the, in the uh, map here, uh, is shaped like an L. The short side of the L went from the river to the sea, and that's the part that remains today. On the very far left is where the, the main attack came. That's the Shepherd's Battery. The attack on the right it was a naval battalion, uh, a, uh, a naval brigade uh, that was a diversion to keep uh, them from concentrating on the Shepherd's Gate. The Shepherd's Gate was right up against the river. So on January 15th, they were ready. Following a long bombardment, they landed again above Fort Fisher, unopposed in their, their landing. Had the Confederacy had enough men or any chance of, uh, of stopping them at the water's edge, you would think that would be something that they would want to do. Uh, it is when the, the Union landing forces would be most vulnerable. And if you can't stop them at the water, you're probably not going to be a stop them once they've established the beachhead ashore. But on the on the uh, Confederate left at the Shepherd's Gate, uh, the men of General Adelbert Ames's division breached the Shepherd's Gate. The Confederate garrison was coming out of the casemates where they had withstood the bombardment, only to find that the Federals were already in the fort. And Ames' men went from battery to battery in turn as they worked their way over each mound of sand to the point where the two L's joined, which was called the Northeast, Northeast Bastion. Nothing remained for the Confederates now but to retreat towards Battery Buchanan at New Inlet. There was no effort to rally a defense there was not enough men to do so, even had the spirit been there to make that that sort of defense. Sure, small pockets maybe stopped the fire before they could continue their retreat, but uh, as far as an organized uh, counterattack, uh, there wasn't much. Evacuation to the mainland was the only viable option for the remainder of the 40th uh, North Carolina troops that were still at Fort Holmes once Fort Fisher had fallen. They made their way to Smithville and headed north. The Union forces occupied both Caswell and Fort Holmes the next day. On February 19th, under forces under Jacob Cox, captured Fort Anderson further up the river with few shots being fired. This was the last possible stand, the last prepared defense. There would be small pockets of defense uh, on the way back to Wilmington. And even at five uh, at Forks Road in Wilmington, uh, a, a, a defense uh, was made but that soon fell and Wilmington fell soon after. Time and tide has claimed much of Fort Holmes. However, in 2006, a resident of Bald Head Island, a gentleman named Jack Gorey, wrote an excellent article for the North Carolina Review, October 2006 issue, entitled Mapping Fort Holmes, a search for Confederate ruins at Baldhead. His research uncovered every known map of the fort. 
and then provided, uh, and Jack had an interpretive markers placed at those sites uh, of where the fort wall remains, at the batteries, and at several of the, uh, of the uh, obvious spots where, where a section of the fort remains, which are very few. This map that you see here is part of a brochure that the Brunswick Civil War Roundtable produced uh, to highlight the history of the fort and show folks where the markers are. Uh, the text, uh, uh, this was produced by myself and uh, with never ending thanks to Chris Fonville, who originally worked with Jack Gorey on the text for the markers that are on Fort Holmes. Uh, Chris did the text uh, uh, for this brochure here. Uh, we're hoping to shed some, some light on the history of, of uh, Fort Holmes and that the brochures, you can get them uh, either at the, uh, at the Bald Head Island Visitor Center, uh, at the Maritime Museum, at Fort Anderson, at Fort Fisher, at the related historic, site, uh, historic sites in our area. I hope you have enjoyed this brief history of Fort Holmes and we'll visit Bald Head Island and view the markers and the remains of the fort with a better understanding of the rich history of Fort Holmes and the Cape Fear River in the American Civil War. Thank you and I hope you have enjoyed this um, and we'll see you soon. Hopefully we'll be able to get out of our uh, restrictions and get back to our round table meetings, get back to our events at the Oak Island Parks and Recreation uh, and to be able to visit the sites. Thanks.